better person to introduce tonight's speakers than Alex Washburn, who is the chief urban designer of the city of New York. And that's pretty sexy. Um, of course, with everything sexy, there are some parts that are a little dirty and nasty and not so clean. But it's okay. We are going to hear about the good stuff tonight. So, Alex, would you like to come to the stage? Here he is. Please. Big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Urban design is about change, as you may gather from the slide. But the puppy is there just to get your attention. But if you, if you don't want change, then you don't want urban design. Um, and you shouldn't be here, really, uh, without a desire to leave the city better than you found it. This is a desire that actually Mayor Bloomberg put into a very technical document called Plan YC on um, Earth Day 2007. And it laid out some changes that we have to make to our city in order to survive, maybe thrive at least, in the coming, um, the coming era. And those challenges are three. The first one is that we've got to grow by about a million people. But we're not going to grow our boundaries. So how do we do it? Well, the answer, as you can tell from the diagram, has to do with transit-oriented development follow our subway systems. We also have to become sustainable. We have to reduce our emissions, mitigate them, and also prepare our city for the climate change that already came, like Irene. But most important for me is that we have to keep designing great public spaces. That's my daughter in Paley Park. And that's the space that actually Amanda Burden, my boss, helped her stepfather design. Um, and set a standard for public space that brings us into today. But, you know, this is the 200th anniversary of the grid, the New York City grid, which changed us. You know, it took us from a 18th century economy into the Industrial Revolution, but it didn't have any open space. It said if you wanted open space, you had to go to the shore. Well, that worked great until somebody invented the steam engine, and then the shores were turned over to commerce. So it took the first great New York City urban designer, Frederick Law Olmsted, to bring nature into the heart of the city. And he did that by carving out 800 acres of prime land in the middle of Manhattan. But that heart of nature gave us the humanity to bring us into the 20th century. But we meet this guy, another great New York urban designer. Think of him what you will. The guy wanted change, and he got it. We needed more of everything, of course, and more housing, more transportation, and Moses, the power broker, got it. Um, the slide's going to change in five seconds, so I can't tell you my Moynihan story. <laughs> All right. But uh, anyway, I used to work for Senator Moynihan, who used to work for Governor Harriman, who remembers Moses coming into the room with a manila folder with a list of projects he wanted done. He'd hand that folder to the governor, and he'd walk out of the room. Case closed, Moses gets what he wants. And he wanted a lower Manhattan expressway. Unfortunately, that's also where he met Jane Jacobs. And Jane Jacobs, that's her bar, the White Horse Tavern, a place far less, I don't know what the right adjective for this space is, but far less than that adjective, and more homey. This is where she developed her sense of neighborhood. And it's interesting, she and Moses fought to a standstill. No Lower Manhattan Expressway, but in the same year, 1961, she published The Death and Life of Great American Cities, but also the Zoning Commission amended the zoning resolution to the 1961 ZR, it's called, which made Moses's changes, Towers in the Park and Automobile, as of right. So that kind of led to a, a conundrum. There was a problem between top-down and bottom-up, and this was kind of fought over for the next decade or so. And nobody really knew who was in charge, because the city had um, community boards that were empowered beginning in 1968, but also had mega projects. Okay, the, the puppy's back because I wanted to talk to you about the solution that came out. 1975 Euler, Uniform Land Use Review Procedure. That's how we finally balanced the Moses top down with the Jane Jacobs bottom up. And I'd go through the process, but you're better off just looking at the dog. Here's a graphic of changes that have happened in the zoning code. On the left, 1916, big swaths of the city zoned a particular way. 1961, it gets finer grain. And then today, with all our special districts, it gets super fine grain. 
we're starting to use the tools we have of Euler and the zoning code to make the city very fine grained. And we're using urban design tools to, to take existing conditions, throw on computer models, sketch over them, draw, try to get a sense of what it's like to be in a place before we make the decision to make that place. And therefore, that's what gets the public a sense of the process and lets the bottom-up part really matter. Okay, so here's an example of a product of Euler, the West Chelsea rezoning. And that's the rezoning that took the area around the High Line and made it possible to have new housing, new galleries, and also to save the High Line itself as a park. And what I would ask is, like, well, what would those great New York urban designers think of it? Well, Robert Moses would think, wow, I like the economic development, almost $4 billion in counting. But he would be incredulous to think that two community guys, Josh and Rob, started the whole thing going. On the other hand, what would Jane Jacobs think of it? My sense is she would love the street life. She would love the fine grain, the galleries, the cafes that have sprung up, the interesting step-by-step um, -step character of the street. But she would never, never have trusted government to make the zoning regulations that turn this into a human-scale neighborhood. And finally, Olmsted. You know, Olmsted probably would have loved the High Line. Um, it's a ramble through nature. But at the same time, he would have thought of us as being pretty crazy to put it 20 feet in the air. And those three different views, the quantity of Moses, the quality of Jacobs, and the nature of Olmsted, well, I call them my three bosses. Those are the three things that we have to do in every project we do today to make it change the city in a way that leaves it better than we found it. And that's what urban design's role is, is to change it. And when you leave the city better than you found it, that's something that really expresses civic virtue. And I think what you're gonna to see tonight in all the projects is a glimpse of civic virtue at work in New York City at the beginning of the 21st century. And I hope we succeed in knowing the quality of the people presenting, and I'm sure we will. So thank you. Thank you very much.